It's August 24th, 2023. Uh, here's a bunch of papers that were published today on Archive that I thought were interesting and some GPT summaries of them. If you want to read these summaries along with there's prereq knowledge listed and citations, it'll be on my Substack link in description. This first paper though is not published today. It's actually a very old one, um, but I wanted to add it to my list to read later. So uh, it's here right now, just so you all can uh, get a first look, I guess, or no, who cares? I know I'm gonna read it, so I'm just gonna throw it into um, Obsidian right away. Let's get on with that. All right, that was a quick first paper. Here we go. Simple is better and large is not enough toward ensembling of foundational language models. University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Okay. Ensembling foundation language models can significantly improve their performance and reliability. I'm pretty sure, I was curious about this, I need to look it up honestly. I think ensembling is just combining a bunch of models letting them talk to each other. Let's, uh, let's confirm that though. This is uh, one of those words I've been seeing forever and never bothered to look up and just assume I know what it meant, but I probably don't. Um, what does ensemble mean in the context of machine learning? model that combines the predictions from multiple machine learning algorithms to make more accurate predictions than any individual model. Yeah, that's what I thought. And there's different types. Let's not get into it, though. Okay. Um, ensembling foundational language models for improved performance reliability. Do, 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 do. Issues like hallucination. By ensembling smaller ones, we can leverage the relative strengths and compensate for their weaknesses. Combining their outputs. In this research, all has proposed three ensemble techniques, shallow, semi, and deep ensembles. They may do experiments and show that ensembling outperforms individual models. The deep ensemble incorporates knowledge graphs. Okay, um, good for y'all. Sure, that works great. Uh, not gonna read it though. Oh, I should be doing the lap thing. Darn. You get used to this. This method. We're gonna new method. Recording of fifty business assignments. I, I don't know what that. What that title meant, I, my hope is that it means that they are recording actual, like, huge amounts of data on individual businesses, like small businesses, and we can now use those to get our first little tests of having a language model operate a business based off of pre-known knowledge of that business. Okay, it's a data set. Insights into how users follow business assignments. I think that means, like, employees, I think. By analyzing recordings of 50 real business processes, organizations can gain a comprehensive understanding of the underlying low-level tasks and their interconnections through various application programming interfaces, APIs. By leveraging process mining techniques, businesses can identify common patterns and frequent tasks that can be automated using Microsoft Power Platform connectors. This seems boring. Oh, this is an actual Microsoft paper. Oh. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, if you're into automation, this helps you do business automation, I guess. Okay. Boring. Pre-gated mixture of experts. This is what made me remember to download the um, MOE foundation paper. Um, pre-gated MOE, an algorithm system co-designed for fast and scalable mixture of expert interface or inference. This is a Microsoft paper along with other people, other universities. Uh, what's going on here? Our proposed pre-gated mixture of expert system addresses the challenges of deploying LLMs with MOE architecture. 
MOE has two main challenges. If you don't know what MOE is, basically, um, uh, you, I, I haven't read the paper actually about it. I'm, I'm only vaguely aware of this. Is like, so GPT-4 has like a trillion parameters, but in any given use of GPT-4, you only actually use around 200 something billion, is, is the rumor anyways. And the reason being that when you pose your question, whatever it is, uh, a tiny model categorizes that question and then tells the big model, uh, the big collection of models, which expert, which especially good at that task model should be assigned to that task kind of thing. Um, so literally bringing together experts, of, the expertise of different models. Blech. Um, MOE requires a large amount of memory, making it difficult to fit within limited memory on a single GPU, and it dynamically activates only a subset of the experts, resulting in low GPU compute utilization and high deployment cost. Okay. Our pre-gated MOE system combines algorithmic and system level optimizations. Novel function selects the experts to activate in advance. Oh, interesting, maybe. I just assumed that was already a thing, but I'm probably wrong. I'm definitely wrong. Reducing the sequential dependency between expert selection and execution. All right. Just kind of whatever for me. Um, it's not something I have to worry about for my purposes. Out of the cage, how stochastic parrots win in cybersecurity environments. This seemed interesting. I um, don't know him, but I know the family of the guy who's head of cybersecurity for Walmart. And I'm just interested in the co concept in general, of like what's going to happen over these next five, ten years. Um, but what does it mean stochastic parrots are good? New approach uses LLMs uh, duh, 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 duh. by using LLMs as attacking agents. They can perform well as or even better than traditional reinforcement learning agents that require extensive training. Interesting. In fact, the best performing LLM agents were able to achieve a 100% win rate in certain scenarios, outperforming other agents that have been trained for thousands of episodes. Ooh, so LLM is doing something better than reinforcement learning. The up until now, my impression of the RL gang has been that they are pretty anti LLM, think it can't replace RL. But uh, this is at least a, a significant use case where that might be actually false. Um, da -da 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 -da. It can be used to simulate and test various attack scenarios. New networks. They developed a new network security environment called NetSet Game, which provides a realistic platform for training and testing LLM-based agents. The environment mimics real-world attacks and includes a defender to make the scenarios more challenging. Oh, very cool. I don't know enough about cybersecurity or anything or whatever, but very cool. Maintaining plasticity via regenerative regulation, regularization. In AI, uh, plasticity loss is a problem. Uh, it occurs when neural networks lose their ability to adapt to new information over time. This is a challenge in continual learning scenarios. We propose simple effective solution called L2 init, which is a modification of a commonly used technique called L2 regularization. So, L2 regularization. Basically, you have your, what happens there is basically you have your actual goal function, your actual loss function, and next to it, like added on to it, you also have this L2 um, value, right? Which it, the, the name has to do with like squares or something in the way it's, the way it's set up. But basically what it does is it punishes, it punish, punishes, 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 it punishes the model for using all of its weights and specific and for for using um, large values in its weights. All right, what that means is like um, a, a model is incentivized to take weights that aren't that useful and just push them down to zero. Uh, the way it works is like it takes all the weights and it like sums them and squares them or something or other like that. And in, it's basically tells the model, hey, minimize this as well as your actual objective function. Um, and you have to it's not a ratio of which one's more important. The actual objective function or the L2 regularizer, but 
regularizer, whatever. Um, but anyways, uh, it's good for creating sparsity in models. Uh, it's good. I think it helps with generalization, I think. Um, and it's good to prevent overfitting, I, th I think. I, I don't know. I'm, I've only used it, used it myself in um, easy regression scenarios. But it's applicable to any scenario with an optimization function and parameters. Anyways, L2 init helps maintain the plasticity. Oh, so apparently, um, okay, this so I'm not. It is not clear if L2 regularization actually causes this plasticity loss. It doesn't say that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it does, though, because it kind of discourages taking weights that have already been turned to zero and using them again. I wouldn't be surprised if L2 regularization actually causes the lack of plasticity in some scenarios, or to some extent, but whatever. L2 init helps maintain the plasticity of neural networks by regularizing the network's parameters towards their initial values, rather than towards zero, as in traditional L2 regularization. Interesting. We're pushing them back to their initial values rather than towards zero. Okay. Well, but so this no longer helps with sparsity. It's no longer helps with turning things into zeros for sake of decreased computation. Uh, but I see how if the weights don't go to zero, if they go to just some whatever the initial value set was, then I see how that would encourage l continual learning in the future because it's easier to start learning from a random decimal value than it is to start learning from zero just given the gradient okay i don't know if that is that is that worth it interesting it's like a trade-off right there the value of l2 in it is that it provides a straightforward and practical method to mitigate plasticity loss in ai systems da -da 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 -da. By ensuring some parameters remain close to their initial values, the network is better prepared to adapt quickly to new tasks or changes in the data stream. This is interesting, I guess. So like relating this back to um, the lottery ticket hypothesis, right? This idea that there are uh, winning tickets, that there are uh, sub networks within an initialized network that uh, are specifically well set up by random chance to be optimize well in this sense it's like if you just if you do focus on sparsity and pruning and on your winning tickets for this first learn learning uh, bout then you are essentially forcing the model to just stay in learning that task and it's never going to get past that i guess because to learn a new task would be to take away from the previous uh knowledge so you'd, you'd mess up continual learning whereas makes sense here how like if you're keeping all of those other sub networks that did not end up being useful for your first learning round um, if you're keeping them then once you add a second uh, once you continue to learn once you add more tasks on or whatever it is that there's a good chance that that continual learning will be able to take advantage of the leftover random sub networks that have not been used effectively interesting okay Requires only single a single additional hyperparameter and can be easily implemented with existing, which I probably is I assume is just like how strongly do you want to force back to to the init values. And other than that, it's probably the, to get init values rather than zero, probably just like a recentering. Although do you not have to like keep more memory then if you want to remember all the init, init values? Interesting. Um, whatever. This makes it a practical solution. Really readily applied in various applications. Okay, it's kind of cool. I'm gonna keep the PDF on my computer and probably not read it. What's it called? Maintaining plasticity. Cool. Layer-wise feedback propagation. Probably not going to read this one. I'm curious as to what they're doing, though. What's this out of some Berlin universities and one Singapore? 
Layer-wise feedback propagation is a novel training approach for AI models uh, that can overcome some limitations of traditional methods. It's an alternative to gradient-based optimization. So gradient-based optimization has drawbacks including instability in training deep models and the reliance on meaningful derivatives, whereas LFP addresses these issues by using explainability techniques, specifically layer-wise relevance propagation to assign rewards to individual connections in the model based on their contributions to solving a given task. By distributing a reward signal throughout the model, LFP strengthens the connections that receive positive feedback and reduces the influence of connections that receive negative feedback. This allows the model to focus on well-parameterized subnets that contribute to solving the task rather than updating all parameters towards a local optimum. That's interesting. Um, how is that that much different from just making the network sparse? You're, you're, you're leaving some parameters as they are. The value of LFP lies in its ability to achieve comparable performance to gradient descent on various models and data sets while also providing some advantages. It can be applied to models with non-meaningful derivatives such as step function activated spiking neural networks. That's, that's, cool. that's good. That's cool. Um, not that I care about those, but it can also be used for transfer learning where existing knowledge can be efficiently utilized to train new models. Yeah. Cool, I guess. <laughs> oh, bless me. Knowledge graph prompting for multi-document question answering. I just, it doesn't matter that I read this at all. Obviously, like, I don't need to read this. It's not my thing. But I so badly want my Obsidian library to get a chatbot. I want to be able to talk to my to my mind, to my second brain, so badly. Um, anyways, uh, the value of knowledge graph prompting for multi-document question answering lies in its ability to enhance performance of LLMs in answering questions that require information from multiple documents. In real-world scenarios like academic research, blah, 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 people often need to analyze and extract insights from multiple documents. Existing language models are really only good at single document question answering. We address this challenge by constructing a knowledge graph that represents the logical asso associations among the contents and structures of different documents. Okay, so this is a method for taking a bunch of documents and quickly constructing a knowledge graph based off of them. And we have good ways for LLMs to interact with knowledge graphs that I'm not very familiar with, but whatever. Um, that's awesome. Consists of nodes representing passages or document structures like pages and tables and edges noting the semantic slash lexical similarity between passages or intra-document structural relations. The LM guided graph traverser, a key component of KP KGP, navigates through the, K the knowledge graph to receive the most relevant passages for answering the question, it uses a language model to generate the next evidence needed to approach the question and selects the most promising neighboring passages based on the generative generated evidence. This is so cool. So like we're taking all the stuff, embedding everything, um, drawing a knowledge graph between uh, portions or sentences or paragraphs or whatever of documents and many documents that have similar semantic meaning, similar embedding factors. And then we are saying, hey, language model, here's a question. Um, first, give me an idea of what information you would theoretically need to answer this question, and it spits out an answer. Then we embed that and get a um, get an actual embedding, like embedding space, uh, answer off that, and then we figure out which part of the knowledge graph has the most similar, um, the most similar in embedding, like semantic structure, and give it to the give it to the LLM and say, LLM, here, use this. And it uses that, and if it's not quite good enough, if it does not answer the question, then we go to nearby um, semantic meanings in the knowledge graph. That's so cool. Improves performance of LLMs in MDQA by providing a structure to comprehensive context. 
for answering multi-document questions. This is so this is so fun. I'm gonna send this to some buddies of mine who also use Obsidian. There, it's not a. Proposes methods. I want to know if they actually gave a GitHub or anything for some code. Because I want so quickly to have this in Obsidian. Okay, um, cool, what's it called again? Knowledge graph. All right, how far are we? Like halfway, I think. How to protect copyright data in optimization of large language models. This one is potentially necessary for the paper I'm writing as like some background info. Uh, da, 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 powerful tools, LLMs, concern of copyright infringement. Uh, what if they generate outputs that resemble copyrighted data? Uh, we propose a method to protect copyright data in the optimization and training of LLMs. We introduce a concept called copyright regression, which modifies the training objective of the models to prevent them from generating copyrighted outputs. This modification serves the model Models learn to generate desired outputs while avoiding copyright infringements. Okay, how does it work though? How does this regression thing work? An additional term, the training objective to discourage the generation of copyrighted outputs. Do they have to like scan for copyrighted outputs? The level of copyright protection can be controlled by adjusting scalar coefficient. Okay, cool if it works. What are they doing? How does this regression? I want to know how it works, but I don't want to read this paper. Copyright regression. Softmax regression. So it doesn't look very complicated. And I'm so tempted because I'm just curious as to how it works, but I know I don't need to know how it works. So I'm just going to ignore it. I do think I might want to keep it to cite for sake of saying that I'm citing newish papers. Um, in my paper I'm writing right now. Oh, damn it. Okay. Dynamic landslide susceptibility mapping over recent three decades to uncover variations in landslide causes. Oh, this is for a buddy of mine. Um, what? Ever. Not for me. This is also not published today. This is a PowerPoint from some CS class years ago that I just wanted to make sure I downloaded it and I accidentally put it in my thing today. It's just a quick rundown of the math behind mixture of experts. Um, I may or may not get to this and do a video on it, I would guess no. I'm probably just gonna like skim through it and get the general idea without the actual full proofs or anything is my guess. Um, but I am gonna set it aside to look at later. What's it called, CS something? Okay. Critical learning periods emerge even in deep linear networks. So critical learning periods are a thing for human learning, and we're saying that they happen here as well in deep learning. Uh, time periods early in the training process where temporary deficits or disruptions can have a permanent impact on the learner presentations and behavior of the network. That's cool that that's happening in deep learning networks. Okay which means that they're a fundamental aspect of learning rather than a specific feature of biology.
wait, they're focusing on deep linear networks, not they're like removing nonlinearity. Why would they do that? Okay, they were to, they could let them isolate factors that contribute to the emergence of critical learning periods. Uh, these periods depend on the depth of the network and structure of the data distribution rather than specific architectural or optimization chat details. I just wonder how well it applies if you're if you're using a linear model. Like that's my problem with that. It's UCLA, Stanford, Caltech. I might read this. Um, I'm curious. I'm so behind in my reading, it's absurd. I'm gonna have to just like trim papers and go back and remove them from my list. Or basically, I assume if I can't get to like reading five to six per day. Characterizing normal perinatal development of the human brain structural connectivity. Sounds like a psychology paper. New method for studying development of the brain structural connectivity in the early stages of life. By analyzing data from healthy infants, they could create a baseline of normal brain connectivity metrics during the perinatal period. And that can serve as a reference for comparing the brain development of infants with neurodevelopmental disorders or those exposed to environmental factors that may impact brain connectivity very cool but like this is not an ai paper is it but they used ai in their analysis yeah they just used machine learning in their analysis like this is a machine learning paper not an ai paper okay Algorithm assisted discovery of an intrinsic order among mathematical constants. This sounded cool, but also just way probably too complicated, I would guess. Yeah. Doesn't look too crazy. Not at all. That sounds about right. And what does it mean though? What's it saying? Uh We've developed a computer algorithm that can discover new formulas for mathematical constants. These formulas represent relationships between different constants and provide insights into their properties and complexity. They play a cr these constants play a crucial role in science and math. They often emerge naturally in different contexts and can reveal fundamental connections. Basically, the, the, it's these, there's these numbers that like when they show up in certain places, you're like, oh, why is pi showing up here in this unrelated area of math? Oh, because if we rephrase things this way, we can figure out that, oh, actually, it is related. Like, there is a structural connection. Um, so constants are very interesting. That's pretty cool that they can do that. Um, the algorithm is based on a novel mathematical structure called a cons conservative matrix field. All right, I'm not gonna read it, not up my alley, but uh, very cool nonetheless. Computational Science Laboratory Technical Report. Oh, what's it, what's the title? Adversarial Training Using Feedback Loops. New approach for more, make them more robust against adversarial attacks. Adversarial attacks are when an attacker makes small changes to the input data in order to fool the neural network into a, giving incorrect outputs. There was a, what's his name, a two minute papers video on this a few days ago that was pretty interesting to watch because he has just great graphics on there, very high production quality. Um, da, 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 da. Proposed approach is based on the concept of feedback control da, 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 and control theory by incorporating feedback control into the neural net architecture. We can develop a new type of neural network called feedback neural networks. These feedback neural networks have a controller network that monitors the output of the main neural network and compares it with a reference output. The controller then generates a corrective action that is fed back into the system to stabilize the output. This feedback loop helps the neural network self-correct and maintain a stable output even in the presence of adversarial perturbations. This is cool. Da, da, da. Experimental results um, show that this outperforms state-of-the-art methods in guarding against adversarial attacks. 
uh, the neural networks. And this is basically just like neurosymbolic stuff, which I've been saying for a while is going to be hugely important when we figure out how to properly integrate it. So I'm so tempted to read this paper. So tempted. I don't actually care about adversarial training. And I already, I think, know what, what I need to know about control theory. But this paper looks short. What's that like? Oh, maybe not that short. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, it's relatively short. And I'm just curious as to. I, I need to be reading papers where they implement new architectures. That's the whole thing I want to do. That's my whole like thing I've got going is I need to be like getting exposed to that a bit more. So I'm kind of tempted to still read this anyways. Um, and it just does sound super interesting, honestly. Oh, and it's out of Virginia Tech. Yes, I'll read it. All right. You've 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 convinced me. Who are these people? Ali Hussain Muhammad Rafid and Adrian Sandu. That's awesome. They're, a, they're an easy contact if I need. That's cool. Um... Is this the last one? That's the last one. Okay. Sounds good. I should not have added a four. Jesus Christ. That's too many for me to have added today. Oh boy. I'm adding way too many papers. I'm going to just go through and do like a cleanse at some point of remove from my list. My list, if you want to see it, is way too long right now. It's, where is this thing? This is my list right now. These are papers to read. Uh, these I've read and have not recorded a video yet. These bottom two are coming out today. Uh, these I read and recorded a video on. Um, so I started recording this list whenever I started doing videos basically. Um, exciting though. Uh, yeah, I need to trim this list down I think and knock some stuff out. It's probably gonna be a task of mine, but Okay. Um, anyways, what was I saying? What were we doing? Oh, this thing. And that was the last paper. So yeah, that's, uh, that's it for today. Um, check out the papers in the sub stack, I guess. Not that anyone actually watches these videos or anything. And yeah, end of video.